following interview was conducted with James J. Foster for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on February 19, 2015 at the Purdue Archives and Special Collections SWAIM Conference Room. The interviewer is Renee Gorder. Thank you for coming and being willing to talk with me. My pleasure, sure. <laughs> so just to start, um, can you tell me a little bit about growing up? You said that you were from Gary. What was it like growing up in Gary? Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of fun growing up in Gary the time I did. Uh, I remember 70s, uh, late 60s and 70s uh, more vividly since uh, those were my uh, teen years uh, for the most part. And uh, Gary was sort of booming then because the steel mill was operating full, really strong, uh, getting lots of government contracts. And, and uh, Gary just had lots of people feeling good about things. And people were able to make incentive pay. And so you could, you know, make sure you work fast and, and you get more product out and was able to make even more money. And lots of people were making lots of money. Uh, lots of fun times. Uh, eight high schools there uh, participated uh, highly. And uh, ROTC in one of the high schools made it to the number one spot for the whole city oh, nice. uh, in my senior year. So that was exciting. And uh, just got lots of good memories of uh, growing up in Gary there. And uh, notice that I didn't feel like a minority until after I left Gary and came, <laughs> and came, to, came to Purdue and said, oh, okay, that's what that means. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, unfortunately, Gary's one industry town, mm -hmm. and after uh, the steel was not as in high demand, uh, it went down and a lot of people lost jobs, and Gary's gone down economically quite a bit. You can tell the population's gone down, so it's uh, it's kind of sad to, to go back and visit, but my wife's mother's still there. She's from Gary as well, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we go back uh, quite often, so uh, we, we get a chance to stay connected with some of the people there. I always think of the, the song from The Music Man. Gary oh, yes, there. yes, yes. <laughs> every, every time we're driving and we pass by, it just starts to Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and enjoyed being so close to Chicago, mm -hmm. only 25 minutes away. And so in the evenings and weekends, we go over there to avoid the traffic and just drive around and just have fun. And uh, enjoy the lake. Gary had uh, a couple of beaches on the lake. And uh, Chicago, I love the guy who fought long and strong years ago for Chicago to keep the lakefront property as public property so anybody had access and so even poor people could go have fun on the lakefront and so that was pretty neat and uh, just uh, we still love Chicago we go back quite often as, as we can so so then what brought you to Purdue you said you moved here in 1975 right? yes yes uh, I uh, was graduating in high school uh, in 69 and the uh, vice principal asked me what my plans were well my parents hadn't attended college, and so uh, and my father had served in the Navy. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, okay, I'd let Uncle Sam pay for my education. And then this uh, high school vice principal asked me, did I know about financial aid? Uh, he asked me what college, and I hadn't applied to any college, so he uh, demanded I be in his office the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> and so that morning he had an application, two applications on his desk, one for Purdue and one for IU. Well, Purdue responded the fastest and had the most attractive financial aid package, and so that's how I got a chance to uh, decide on Purdue. Sight unseen hadn't been here yet, but, uh, but that worked out. Came as an undergrad in 69 uh, and uh, became active in uh, one of the uh, Greek organizations, Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity, and had um, uh, good uh, memorable experiences uh, working. I went back to Gary over the summers to work in the uh, steel mill, but uh, college students were first in and last, I mean, you know, last in and first out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, so didn't get to work very many hours that summer. And uh, the following summer, I was fortunate enough to get a job to work uh, for the Upward Mound program uh, based in uh, Purdue Calumet. Okay. And uh, came down as a counselor and worked my way up to, in fact, when I graduated, became the uh, first assistant director of the program and got a chance to do that. Um, when I, uh, let's see, when I graduated from Purdue in 73, uh, got that job with Purdue Calumet, worked a couple of years, got married, and decided I wanted to go for a more permanent job and had made some contact with uh, housing uh, staff members here. 
and uh, they said if I'm ever interested, uh, they come and ask questions. And so that led to a position in housing and food service, and I became an assistant manager and had a chance to uh, join the team as an assistant manager. After about five years, I uh, was promoted to manager, managed McCutcheon Hall for uh, 22 years. Uh, after that, uh, I had volunteered to be a, a diversity facilitator, having uh, took that as a personal challenge to deal with a sensitive topic in a positive way. I wanted to see if there's a way to deal with that positively before people are turned off about some of those things that people get turned off about. And uh, that really uh, gave me opportunity to sort of pave the way uh, to more things to work with diversity in housing and food service, and therefore they made me the key diversity person on staff there and administrator and so forth, and, and that really worked out. And uh, after uh, working with that, I was tapped to uh, present for diversity workshops in lots and lots of different venues, uh, not only on campus but off campus and, and even down in Trafalgar, Indiana. Oh. Yeah, so just lots and lots of good experiences that I, I remember there. Can you tell me a little bit more about the Upward Bound program? Yes, what, yep. What it is, what it entails? Sure. Upward Bound program was an outreach uh, to inner city children, especially low income, uh, to give an opportunity uh, to college. And so the Upward Bound program uh, was a way to invite students to think about going to college and plan to go to college so that they can do what they need to do in high school in terms of taking their correct courses, getting good grades, uh, and, and look forward to uh, uh, opportunity to, uh, to attend college. Uh, the Upper Bound program uh, served uh, quite a bit of students, quite a, quite a few students, federally funded program. And uh, the uh, president signs, signed the education bill for uh, the uh, program to receive its funds. And uh, as assistant director, I was uh, responsible for working with uh, the counselors of the program. It was a year-round program, and so while uh, we worked with visiting the students and meeting with the students uh, uh, on a regular basis uh, in the Geary, uh, Lake County area, and uh, East Chicago, Geary, and, and those areas up there. Uh, during the summer, we would bring the students to the main campus of Purdue, and they would have an experience on campus in terms of attending classes and just, just getting uh, you know, acclimated to what college life would be like and, and, and that sort of thing, and giving us opportunity to really uh, give them a chance to look at uh, what it would take to be a successful college student. And, uh, and it was really just a great opportunity for students who normally wouldn't have had an opportunity if it hadn't been for that kind of support. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, your last position was, let me make sure I get it right, I have it written down here, the Assistant Director of Community and Cultural Outreach. Yes. Can you tell me what would a typical day be like? What would be some of the things that you would do as the uh, Assistant Director? And that, <laughs> that's one of those <laughs> positions that no two days were alike. Yeah. But uh, typically uh, what I would do is... Uh, is, is be involved in uh, collaborating, uh, representing housing and food service in different collaborations. I attended meetings where uh, program directors of uh, the minority program students uh, programs would <clears throat> uh, would meet and discuss ways that uh, Purdue uh, could be a good help, or ways that the, the university uh, could be a good support uh, to minority students and that sort of thing. Uh, that was sort of the community outreach. Uh, working with uh, other aspects, I worked with the conference division there, and with conferences, uh, we just, throughout the school year, made those plans for the summer conferences that come on campus and worked with the details and that, so I supported the conference division uh, in terms of uh, uh, being prepared uh, for those conferences to have uh, a good positive experience when they came to Purdue in the summer. And an outreach, again, for Purdue, uh, outreach in, in a couple of ways. One is the a lot of times uh, summer programs would house students, and so we give those uh, middle school students, high school students an experience at Purdue, and hopefully that would lead to them thinking about Purdue when it's time to uh, apply to a, attend college. So just uh, kind of an outreach in that sense as well. And uh, would also work with training the RAs and staff of housing and food service in terms of diversity. And uh, over the years, 
I developed a large repertoire of uh, components for workshops. And so as a, as a certified facilitator and then also as a trained diversity facilitator, uh, was just really afforded great opportunities uh, to help bring uh, our staff along so that we can in turn bring our students along in terms of being more open-minded, working across culture, more intentional working across culture, and those kinds of things. So I felt like it was an honor for me to be able to present to all 300 of our RAs and give them some tools for their toolbox uh, to, to develop what I refer to as inclusive skills. And so uh, while they were developing uh, you know, lots of other skill, leadership skills, writing skills, just right. And I said, well, inclusive skills, would, it would be bad to leave that out. Mm -hmm. And so to build that, give them opportunities to really look at that and uh, give an experience in terms of learning how uh, to uh, be more interested in other cultures, working more effectively with other cultures, and being able to do that without feeling like you've got to take on other people's values, mm -hmm. and you keep your values, you work with cultures, but be encouraging. And so it was kind of neat to be in that position as well and being able to affect that so that the RAs and other staff members can develop programs and, and give interactive opportunities. Uh, I stay focused on presenting workshops in light of the fact that I wanted uh, experiences in the room in terms of people interactive and, and especially get to what I refer to as authentic dialogue, make the room safe for people to talk about how it was when they grew up so people can hear each other's stories and, and hear some realities and some things that lead to understanding because I made the point <clears throat> about the fact that uh, understanding really is what opens the door to all the other good positive aspects of developing relationships. And two key things that I remember uh, really helping to make it uh, more attractive in terms of people attending the workshops was to really start off on, with the premises that uh, diversity is about the fact that everybody counts. It's not just for these people over here, or those people over there, putting people against people. It's really about everybody counts. And if it's about everybody counts, then the next question to answer is, what can we do today to make things better in light of the reality of the history of our country in terms of slavery and all those kinds of things. And so what can we do today to make things better? And, and each one of us can contribute in some kind of way. So keeping it doable, keeping it realistic in terms of uh, good, uh, authentic dialogue. Well, it sounded like an exciting position. It really was. It really was. Uh, I was I was able to do... Uh, a lot of things in a lot of different ways and and I was really fortunate to be a part of uh, <clears throat> of housing and food service division which put a priority on professional development mm -hmm. and always said they put their money where their mouth was because they paid me to go to conferences and seminars and really develop myself professionally so I got a chance to really uh, do that I remember one time I was excited I developed a peer mentor program where we got uh, uh, students uh, involved in helping other students and uh, to do that within the ranks of the students being a part of the the underrepresented groups being able to do that uh, started that in 2003 and developed that to a point where students who would volunteer would become stronger applicants for the RA position because of those experiences and especially working across culture and I made the point <clears throat> that if students uh, if, if students, uh, when students interview for uh, job positions for their career, and they're in position to say that I've got this experience having worked across culture intentionally and, and had these kinds of experiences there, uh, that would make them even more employable, uh, you know, more attractive to uh, potential employers and uh, to, to gain that experience to do that. So it was really, really a, a good benefit uh, for that to take place. Uh, after the peer mentor program ran for a few years, uh, just at the year I was retiring in 2010, uh, developed what was called the uh, You Are Global program, where we, Housing and Food Service said, we really need to make sure we're doing things to help the uh, transition for uh, our international students, just like we were helping the transition for new students uh, from underrepresented groups who met some unique kinds of challenges, uh, the international students, unique challenges for them 
uh, how to approach police. The police are more helpful in our country than they are in other countries. And so those kinds of differences there. And, and just to really talk about even cultural difference in terms of eye contact in our country, uh, you know, expressing something different than eye contact in other countries. And just a lot of those things. And get a chance to share those things, understand those things, learn those things, work with those, and be more effective in developing relationships uh, across culture. So it was really neat to be in that position and be able to do those things. And you've, from what you sent me and then from my various searches online, I searched through Purdue to try and, you know, and find things to, to try and get to know you as much as I can before we get here. Uh -huh. You're very involved with campus with a lot of different organizations. Yes, yes. Can you uh, tell me about some of those? Yes. Uh, uh, like I mentioned, even <clears throat> uh, in undergrad, uh, involved with uh, the Greek organizations, and I learned more about <clears throat> many other different organizations. Um, in terms of what the students were doing. Uh, in my positions as a professional on campus, I uh, got a chance to work a lot with the Black Culture Center, uh, worked a lot with uh, other cultures and Latino Culture Center after it got started, was a part of, of uh, helping uh, them get on track and get started and that sort of thing. And then the Native American Culture Center uh, uh, coming, on, coming on board. So had a chance to, to work with them as well. Like I mentioned, uh, working with the campus division. Uh, being the key diversity person for housing and food service afforded me to even work with our Purdue Memorial Union staff. So I got a chance to work with all staff, worked in uh, married student housing. In fact, my first position was part-time married student housing administrator and part-time diversity administrator. And uh, housing and food service listened to my voice when I mentioned that we needed, we wanted a lot of good development in both of those positions. So we needed a person in each of those. And, and, and they uh, followed my recommendation. I became the diversity person <laughs> and they got someone else in to, uh, to bring things along with with uh, married student housing because we had done programming, didn't have RAs and that sort of thing in married student housing. And so we had four at the time I was there and that developed into nine and even more later on and a lot more offerings and programs to support uh, not only the students who live there, but their families and lots of good family connections there with a lot of international students mm -hmm. uh, living, uh, choosing, choosing that mode of living. And uh, got a chance to work uh, with the, uh, like I mentioned, the program directors with the different programs there, uh, being able to uh, present diversity to a lot of different venues. Uh, the School of Agro, different, different colleges and schools invited me uh, to come in. Uh, one, fun, uh, one fun relationship I developed was, was with the, uh, there's a, a professor in pharmacy who invited me back every year to speak to a couple, about 200 uh, new pharmacy students, and uh, the dean uh, was really instrumental in helping uh, the pharmacy students understand that they really need to know uh, that working across culture would make their jobs more effective mm -hmm. in terms of if they want to help people from different walks of life, different cultures, here's a way to understand why people do what they do and act the way they act and that sort of thing. And so it was fun to be able to present a workshop uh, to 200 in a lecture hall mm -hmm. and being able to do that effectively. And again, keep it at a workshop level, interactive, so that they can see and, and see uh, the differences in the room and to help make the statement that diversity is more than just race. Mm -hmm. And so to look at all the different aspects of that as well, being able to do that. In fact, uh, I mentioned uh, Trafalgar, Indiana. One of the RAs received a teacher assistant position at a school in Trafalgar, Indiana. And the English teacher of the sophomore English class had a heart for the school uh, learning to work across culture. In fact, she had a personal goal that she wanted her children to grow up knowing uh, people other than just uh, Caucasians. Mm -hmm. And so this high school uh, was totally 100% Caucasian except for nine students who were transfers from, uh, no, exchange students from China. China, they had exchange students from China that year. And uh, now it's more diverse because more diverse families live in, in, in the neighborhood and that sort of thing. For, but for about five or six years or so, I was back every year doing a workshop for all the sophomores that came through the sophomore English classes to be able to do that because of that connection with the teacher and, 
and that uh, former RA. And so, uh, so different relationships on campus just led to a lot of different opportunities and a lot of different ways there. I became uh, one of the regular facilitators for Leadership Lafayette, uh, where people volunteer in Lafayette to participate in a program to learn how to become an effective board member of an agency or something like that. And so uh, part of that, again, was to really give them an opportunity uh, to learn uh, some inclusion skills uh, to be able to work across culture intentionally and make it work and make it count towards some, some good things there. So maybe stepping back a little bit to when you first started the university residences, I have a list here. Tell me if this is right. I have that you worked um, at McCutcheon, Terry Courts, Cary Quadrangle, and Purdue Village. Okay. Right? It was Fowler Courts, but Fowler. yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yes, yes. So those are a lot of different, I mean, they're different halls. In what ways are they similar and what ways were they different? Okay, in the ways that they were similar, we all wanted to make sure that the students received what we refer to as the education that they would get from living in the residence halls. And we were intentional about calling ourselves educators outside the classroom and helping students live with their roommates and mm -hmm. live with each other. And we got all into the years where more and more students would come and they didn't even have to share a room with a sibling, let alone share a room with a roommate. Yeah. So, so to, really, to really help in that sense. So we were all alike in that sense. Uh, we were different in the sense that each hall was sort of autonomous and so a manager of a hall was was sort of like the city of a uh, the, the mayor of a city and uh, and that particular hall uh, having its own food staff having its own custodial staff when programming would come could really do some things to transform the hall for instance in the dinner dances uh, to really make it uh, a unique theme for students' experiences for that particular <clears throat> location could work closely with the student organization of that hall uh, to do some things and support them in unique ways and uh, and just had the had the freedom uh, to do that. So those differences came about there, and of course, uh, the characteristic of the hall uh, took on. Uh, it's characteristics from influences from that manager, that manager style, the staff that's involved there, and the traditions that had been going on at that hall over the years. And so it was kind of neat to do that and to see those traditions. I started off at, at uh, Fowler Courts, worked a, uh, a semester there, and then went to Owen Hall after that. Uh, Fowler Courts whole different unique situation. Populations were different in terms of looking at what students were attracted to live in the courts or what students who by the time they filled out their application and their housing request uh, didn't have a whole lot of choices if, you know, if, if they wanted more choices, more popular choices than what they were receiving. So got a chance to see those dynamics at work. Owen Hall, a different animal living, uh, the students who lived there included students who were involved in athletics because close to the athletic mm -hmm. department. And so you got the athletes who lived there. And so again, different characteristics, but being able to just kind of work with that in addition to the traditions of the hall. And then promoted to be manager. No, I went to Cary Quad first and worked at Cary Quad for a couple of years before I was promoted to manage McCutcheon Hall. Cary Quad, all men mm -hmm. again. So uh, Owen was all men back then as well. So again, differences in terms of an all men's hall and the, the, the themes and men really excited about the times that they were invited to go over and do some things with the women halls mm -hmm. or back in the early years to go serenade and just different yeah. kinds of things like that. So a lot of unique experiences uh, took place uh, again because of the settings there and Kerry was just so large over over a thousand men in one location mm -hmm. and uh, uh, just that unique but again lots and lots of athletes who lived there the football players and so forth and uh, and then I was promoted to be the manager of McCutcheon Hall. McCutcheon was co-ed and so uh, <clears throat> I remember one of my uh, one of my assistant managers uh, came in and pulled the door closed and when I was dealing with uh, disciplinary situations and she, she could tell that I had been accustomed to working with men, and she let me know that when I'm working with discipline with women, I really don't have to come as hard and direct <laughs> as, as you might have to do that with, 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 with men. And so that was an education for me in terms of that. And that's right, a little tender-hearted uh, to work with the women there 
in terms of them being able to get the point <laughs> a little bit different in a general sense. So that was kind of unique to learn about those differences and work with that. But enjoyed my 22 years at McCutcheon uh, before going over to uh, Mary Student Housing, Purdue Village. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then at Purdue Village, again, really different in light of the fact that that was kind of the low-cost facility that international students love, fit the budget better, and still had them on campus, uh, gave them a chance to learn how to drive vehicles, because many of them came from um, backgrounds where you know, driving a vehicle wasn't as, as, uh, as common, and uh, just working with that. And then learning how uh, those students really were so family-focused that grandparents would come live with the students. Oh, really? And yeah, and so they were there and available to help babysit and things like that. And the grandparents were the ones who would uh, tend the gardens. There were garden plots that were offered to the people who lived there. And so international students really, again, coming with the background of having raised their own a lot mm -hmm. uh, in terms of doing that, enjoyed those garden plots. And, and when some were really, really artistic about what they brought over, what they developed in those garden plots, and just really, and again, I, I thought of that because that's one of those activities that the grandparents got to do when they had time on their hands to go out and do some things and uh, do those kinds of things. Do they still have those garden plots? The garden plots are not where they used to be, but when Highway 231 was built, that really ran right through where the garden plots were, but uh, Housing and Food Service came up with another location for the garden plot. So across Airport Road, uh, on the other side, was able to develop the garden plots over there. So that's, that was a real plus uh, for those students living down there, those families that live there as well. So they're still going. Oh, that's good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I take the inner loop okay. bus route because I usually park in Discovery. And okay. Bus and so it goes right through there. And so I'm always going through yes. the new village. But I had never you know, noticed that. see, yeah, they're out, they were out on the outskirts there. So that was one of the pluses that those students really love to have there. And so we were really heartbroken to hear that we were going to lose the garden plots, but got happy again when we found out there's a way to get them going in another location. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, so what have you found most challenging and then most rewarding with your positions at Purdue? Most challenging, I think, was the changes. Um, the changes that would come as, as we looked at the, uh, the makeup of our student population, as we looked at the characteristics of the different generations of students to come through and to work with that. And then, of course, uh, the changes that needed to take place as things evolve in, in our world. And so in the housing world and, and things working with that and working with uh, different restrictions by law, working with different, uh, uh, just different demands and, and different expectations on the parents and so forth. So, so it's working with those. And one thing that pops in my mind is the buildings that were built were all built in the 60s and 70s, and there really wasn't that push to put central air in the buildings. <laughs> but then as we got into the 80s and 90s, there were students coming who didn't live without air conditioning. And so what is this living without air conditioning, having the windows be open with all the dust coming in and so forth? So that was one of those changes we had to look at. And I remember a study uh, that we had to do uh, system-wide in terms of, okay, do we put central air in or do we put units in like hotels and motels mm -hmm. and, and had to do that long-range study in terms of what would be the maintenance cost, what would be the, in addition to the insulation costs and things like that. So that was both challenge and exciting in a sense in terms of, of dealing with those things. And so, and I think that uh, when I think about uh, the most difficult aspect, uh, at the time toward the end of, the, end of my career before retiring uh, was parents being more and more involved in our handling of students in their disciplinary situations and parents being so involved to the point that uh, many parents are highly involved before they knew what the facts were and so uh, it's it's natural for a parent to want to take up for their child and, or son and son or daughter and so it was natural for that but to get so highly involved as to have an attorney call us oh, to wow. make sure that you know those kinds of things and the challenge with that was those kinds of things were taking up so much time that I felt a loss at 
the time we could be putting toward more development with our students, more activities with our students, and more of the positive things of bringing them along and, and training students and staff and bringing staff along and those kinds of things. So it became more of a challenge to, to really have to put in the time to deal with those things and, 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 and to deal with all the outsiders that wanted to be involved in, in those situations. And that became, that became a challenge that I remember. Uh, most rewarding, though, when I think about most rewarding was just the interaction with the, I'm a people person. I remember learning uh, early on in life as an undergrad. Uh, I, I accepted, <clears throat> I was accepted in Craner. And, uh, and the first year, you kind of find yourself in terms of what are you really interested in? You want to go marketing <clears throat> or, or something else with corporate or things like that. And I remember being attracted to the people part of things. And back then, they called it public relations. And uh, now it's human resources. And, but just, just working with the people and, and uh, being able to do that. So I learned that I was a people person. Um, uh, to a fault from some perspective, <laughs> some perspectives of other people who, who thought I should really be looking to go corporate and make all the money I could make, you know. <laughs> and so I had different set of values in that. And it worked out well for me because being connected with the people was neat. I really enjoyed <clears throat> being there uh, with the students and the activities, uh, being there, even helping the parents understand we'll take care of your student. <laughs> we'll <laughs> and then being there for staff. And uh, uh, for instance, as a uh, as a, uh, a pastor in a local church in town, uh, I was often uh, presented with an opportunity of somebody coming in and closing my door, asking for a little bit of spiritual counsel or something like that. Or I'm called on to do the wedding for their son or their daughter or somebody, and so they know a preacher. You know? And so it's kind of neat to to have have that overlap. Uh, take place there, but just really enjoyed the staff. After I retired, uh, I uh, remember telling people that you miss the people, and I miss my colleagues, and miss the interaction with the people, and 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 also missed all those memos and and information <laughs> of what was going on with the university and the changes that were coming about, and and those kinds of things there as well. But I really enjoyed uh, again working with the people, and that obviously expanded to working uh, with other campuses, working with other universities, when we had conferences and things like that, Big Ten conferences, and just the connections uh, there, and just that networking in terms of working with the people. So I really, now I think that was the most attractive aspect of the job, being able to do that. In fact, to a point to where when I was promoted, uh, just before I was promoted to be an administrator, uh, I kind of had a long thought about, man, I'm leaving the manager position where I've got hands-on with the students here. And then one of the other administrators said, well, James, just look at it this way. You'll be affecting students in all of our buildings and not just one. So broader aspect, broader effect, broader, uh, broader goals and, and, uh, and opportunities. So that helped me transition to become an administrator of, of the whole system there. Now, um, Elizabeth Hartley did tell me that you were a pastor oh, and okay. that you officiated a few weddings. Yes, issues. yes. Um, <laughs> and then in, in the information you sent me, you're very active within the community. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about um, your ministry or some of the organizations that you're, you're part of? Sure. I noticed that you were part of, on the board of directors for Lafayette Urban Ministry. And yes. That's an orga organization that, that my church, we often donate um, soups and sandwiches and, and help yes, out with that. Yes, so yes, was... yes. That organization, I remember back in the early years, there was a guy named Judd Dolphin before Joe Micon in charge of that. And uh, the right people were attracted to those positions because had a heart for what can we do for those people who don't have hardly any resources? Mm -hmm. And how can we connect people who want to help with people who need the help? And in what ways and what schedules and things like that? So it was just kind of easy to work with that in terms of being able to connect with that because I'm one of those who has a heart for people and so <laughs> that kind of worked with that. And uh, it, was, it was neat to uh, see over the years how that evolved and how the support that that organization would get in terms of doing that. And now, uh, Joe Mikon's able to brag about the fact that he's got about 30 churches working together with volunteers and being involved in doing that. And you've got this, you know, this connection in terms of people really being connected and helping those people who don't have homes, who don't, whatever 
cause them to be at that point in their lives, they find some hope uh, in, in the situation there as well. Uh, I was on the board of uh, Dennis Burton Daycare Center. I did that for a few years. Uh, one of the most active uh, opportunities I had uh, was being, well, I, I'm currently on the, the board for Habitat for Humanity, okay. but volunteered off and on with that. And again, Habitat, building houses for people who normally couldn't afford it, and so giving people a chance to do some work equity to pay for their house, uh, giving people a chance to have a lower mortgage payment than uh, what they would if they were doing everything on their own and getting that kind of help and support. And now, uh, Habitat has gone a, a whole different level in terms of, um, of their effort that's called Neighborhood Revitalization Initiative. And not only building houses for people, but intentionally connecting with people in neighborhoods so that they can look out for each other, mm -hmm. do some things for each other. So uh, active with that part aspect of Habitat uh, to the point of we're praying on the once a week on a Wednesday morning uh, with some people of the neighborhood so that they can be energized and stay interested in uh, working with what else can be done to get people connect with each other and do things for each other. And so they're getting bus shelters built. Their Habitat was involved in building a, sh uh, a storage shelter in a guy's home in, uh, in one of the neighborhoods, and the storage shelter became a bicycle shop. And so kids who maybe can't afford a whole lot can come and maybe get a bicycle or have one fixed and things like that, be involved in it, learn how to work with it. And so learning and just a lot of different aspects uh, in terms of working with that, uh, being able uh, to do those things. I, uh, I uh, let's see, I, I was involved in, uh, uh, let's see, what else am I thinking of? There was, uh, I mentioned Lafayette Leadership, Leadership Lafayette, uh, in terms of uh, facilitating, serving on committee with, with, with those folks and just neat to see people connecting with other people in the community and to see agencies working with each other uh, in the community to really show a uh, more holistic approach in terms of helping people in need and uh, being able to give people a chance to work more closely with, with some of those agencies as well and being involved in that sense. That, that's that's what I think of the top of my head now. I know there are some other things. And, of course, with, from the church front, <clears throat> I'm the uh, president of uh, what's called Pastors Alliance, uh, mainly African-American pastors uh, coming together to be support to each other, do a few things together, a few services together, and that sort of thing. exciting thing about that is we've come into contact with uh, a team. There's uh, uh, a, a, a Pastors Alliance, basically, for Caucasian pastors. And uh, team is Tippecanoe Evangelical Association of Ministers and Ministries with two M's. Mm -hmm. and, and these pastors, in fact, the president approached me and said, James, I realize I don't know very many African-American pastors, and I don't know much about the uh, black church in, in the area and so forth. And so we identified a need for us to be connected and have relationships going and then we are doing some things together. Uh, we came up with the idea of having a diversity workshop with both alliances together and just intentionally learning some more things in terms of being more inclusive and learning about each other. And so uh, our next venture will be uh, to do some things together. Maybe brainstorm what activity, what mission, what assignment, what can we do together mm -hmm. so that we can give our relationships a chance to even grow and, and bond in a sense that way. So kind of need to be involved in that. And I love uh, being a part of, of character building. I think uh, if I think about the aspect of the church that I like in terms of being involved is that character building. We've got these principles from the scriptures that we teach from and learn from and that sort of thing. And so this character building, to me, that's along the lines of development. And that's why I was so excited about working in housing and food service because of development of the students, professional development. So here we go with development spiritually, development with character and that sort of thing. And so just kind of working with that and giving people a chance to, to work more, more intentional about developing themselves uh, in that light. Uh, to be a blessing to somebody else so that people can really see how we're here 
to be a blessing to somebody else, and that's that's the kind of our purpose in life. And it's kind of neat to help people see that big picture, get connected, find their purpose in life, and uh, get connected with those things. Well, let's see. In what ways has Purdue, working at the residence halls, all the jobs that you've had with Purdue, how has that impacted your life? Uh, I think education. Uh, Renee, I can think back and see that my parents were valued education a lot. They didn't have a lot themselves. My mother, I remember her going to night school while I was going to high school uh, to get her GED. Uh, my dad, I remember him working in the steel mill and being just a responsible uh, home uh, father, you know, and, and, and so helping to, to just build us at home and, and, and to, uh, uh, to develop us. And education was highly valued, so they made sure we were at school, they made sure we were in attendance, they made sure we did our homework and that sort of thing. And then when opportunity came to go to college, uh, they were very supportive there. <clears throat> Since they hadn't attended, they didn't know how to, they didn't have tips this year and things like that, but they were very pro-education. And I think that's kind of a, uh, a little characteristic of African Americans in general in terms of looking at our history and being able to learn how to read and, and see that education was kind of a window uh, to a, a better life and more future in life and more options and more aspects. And so uh, I really saw that value in my parents. And, uh, and in fact, I think to the point that back when I was little, if we pretended, I pretended to be the teacher in this <laughs> classroom and things like that. So I can look back and see that. And so coming to Purdue, whole new life. And I just felt so appreciative of the opportunity to get that, you know, secondary level of education, uh, scared to death of, of, of the gap. In my senior high school class, we were studying 20 spelling words, hadn't done a term paper, hadn't, and so coming to college, I saw that there was this gap in terms of people came with being able to do some things that you can do on college level, and, uh, and so having to learn, prepare, and do all at the same time. I even had professors who saw me working so hard to do the catch-up kind of a thing that instead of failing me, they would at least give me a D and say, look, we're going to give you a grade for effort and uh, be able to go from there. And so transition uh, into being able to be a more successful college student as the years went on, just learning a lot fast mm -hmm. and being able to do that. But feel very privileged to have gotten this kind of education and, and gotten this this, uh, I mean, a guy who lived in the projects of Gary, Indiana, who's an administrator at Purdue University, I said, oh, that was, that was kind of my point to look back and see that. So just really appreciated that so much. And I think that that's what charges me to help people bring themselves along and, and be developed. And so just that development, so educational development just really, really stood out real strong in that. So I really think that in my career, my exposure, all those things really came together for that, and that's why I'm excited about bringing others along. Now, you say that you have four daughters. Are any yes. of your daughters Purdue grads? Uh, three of the four. Three. three of the four. And the one that's not got a full ride at the other school. <laughs> I was just going to ask about you. <laughs> she got a full ride. She was, uh, she was really sharp in track. And she okay. was, uh, in fact, she was state champion in uh, the long jump uh, for track. And, uh, and became uh, a little bit outstanding uh, on the college level uh, to the point that she got to go to the NCAA finals oh, wow. and became All-American. I think she got eighth place, but All-American, and we got to see that level of, of track competition out in Eugene, or had been out there oh, yeah. before either, so had a chance to see that. So we had uh, one of our three uh, do that. And uh, I said, unfortunately, Purdue didn't see the potential in her to offer her a full ride yeah. like uh, you did. So that helped because I had four daughters in college at the time. So <laughs> that helped a lot. But uh, the other three, one, uh, one was in Cranford like I was, my oldest. Number two was in diet, uh, diet nutrition, foods and nutrition. And then uh, number three uh, was the one that went to IU. And number four came to Purdue. And uh, they're all in, in their professions now. One's, one's uh, uh, an analyst for uh, enterprise and, and, uh, and, and working at the headquarters and just kind of worked their way up the ranks there. Uh, number two, uh, got a chance to go out to Arizona 
uh, after she graduated from Purdue in, uh, in, in foods and nutrition, knew that she wanted to be another people person mm -hmm. and uh, just kind of uh, uh, the education, the uh, uh, community education programs and that sort of thing. And so she's in charge of clinics that uh, have WIC and other programs mm -hmm. going and that sort of thing. Uh, moved back to the Midwest in Chicago doing the same thing right now. So uh, we're glad to have her back. She's glad to be back with her her sisters and nephews. The girls are having boys. So far, I've got four grandsons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got four grandsons. So that's pretty neat. And then number three is, uh, is uh, no, no, number three is Tandra. Uh, number three, Tandra uh, is the one that uh, went to IU, went on to law school, and now working for a local firm, oh, wow. Stewart and Brandon here. And so, uh, and became became partners too. So mom That's and dad were proud of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then number four is uh, is a leasing manager for one of the apartment uh, complexes. Nice. And so they all uh, in, in in their careers there. So we feel pretty good about that and and see them develop their education level and see a couple of them go on even beyond what dad was able to do. <laughs> Well, that's it. That's about all I have to cover today. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Any last thoughts? Uh, I think I think you gave me a chance to really hit uh, the kind of the essence of me in terms of of that education piece and uh, just the uh, the appreciation of being able to to uh, to be at a Big Ten university and to live in a, in a college town. Exciting to live in a college town and bring my kids up in a college town and uh, and see how we can look back and and wife and I were able to to live close enough to home but not have to live at home that we didn't uh, go down with the ship so to speak in terms of of the sadness and in terms of Gary not being able to develop but at the same time uh, close enough to to be, stay in touch with the family so just appreciative of those things and just excited in terms of working now and I'm back part-time with Purdue so <laughs> kind of flipped the script a little bit there in terms of doing that so I won't be such a burden uh, financial burden to the church, young church. I started a new church a couple of years ago, so being able to do that. So working with the people and, and the development and uh, encouragement. So I, I think you gave me a chance to share the essence of me. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> sure you thing. Much. Sure thing, Renee.